Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome to the 20th lecture of uh, surface engineering. Um, we are still uh, discussing some of the fundamental aspects. Uh, uh, we uh, did discuss uh, quite a bit of it uh, already uh, about structures, about microstructural evolution, defects and then various forms of uh, engineering properties related to the surface. We classified them into mechanical, chemical and uh, physical properties. Uh, we uh, also uh, discussed uh, various uh, uh, approaches of uh, surface engineering. We classified them into possible three possible categories. Um, and then uh, at the moment, we would like to uh, take up discussion on one of the most important uh, engineering solid uh, that is used for various kinds of uh, structural applications meaning where uh, mechanical behavior and uh, performance under various kinds of loads and rate of loading uh, matter. Uh, I'm talking about steel and uh, in fact, if you look at the very first view graph, you, uh, this is uh, a very uh, well-known phase diagram, uh, which is uh, essentially an equilibrium diagram, but uh, for a difference, to be more precise, this is a metastable equilibrium diagram because we are dealing with uh, iron cementite, where cementite is not truly an equilibrium product. But for all practical purposes, because cementite does not transform at room temperature, we consider this to be as good as a, a phase diagram or an equilibrium phase diagram. Now, why is steel so important? I did allude to that in the last lecture and let me repeat that this is the uh, tonnage wise, this is the second most important uh, engineering material for all kinds of structural applications starting from construction to various bodies and various tooling and manufacturing applications. The first question is that why is steel so versatile? Uh, the main reason lies in the fact that uh, when you talk of uh, steel, um, you actually first have to realize that we are talking about a binary where one part is iron and the other part is cementite. So actually, uh, uh, the diagram should have ended at uh, 100%, uh, but this is only up to 6.67%, meaning this is actually 100% of cementite. Now, um, on the other side, of course, we have pure iron. And we can easily see that uh, after solidification at this melting temperature, iron, pure iron undergoes uh, three very major allotropic transformations. So, from delta iron to gamma iron. So, this is the part when steel uh, or uh, iron, pure iron exists only in the form of FCC variety, which is um, uh, called gamma iron and then subsequently transforms to beta and then to alpha and the transformation across the Curie temperature, which is typically about 768 degrees centigrade uh, is only associated with a uh, uh, paramagnetic to ferromagnetic transformation without any change in crystal structure. So, BCC, FCC, then again BCC. And this is very unusual because usually for all metallic systems at room temperature, you would expect the closed pack structure to be stable. In that, uh, by going by that logic, one should have expected FCC to continue until room temperature. But because of a very specific uh, pattern of variation of um, specific heat as a function of temperature for the two crystal logographic varieties or crystal systems, variation of two crystal systems, which essentially could look like this. So, it is because of this variation of the two uh, varieties of the crystal uh, lattices of iron, pure iron. Uh, as a function of temperature, we uh, see that 
uh, if this is the BCC phase, if this is the BCC phase, and if this is the FCC phase, then sorry, if this is the FCC phase, then we realize that uh, in this temperature, in this temperature range, uh, we see FCC to be stable and in this range and in this range the BCC phase to be stable because CP is lower and uh, accordingly the, uh, the stability of the phase depends upon the uh, contribution of CP to uh, enthalpy and entropy. In other words, this is the temperature range. So, we see a, we see a variation of the crystal structure of uh, pure iron going from BCC to FCC and then FCC to BCC. So, this kind of crystallographic transformations of pure iron allows a large number of phase transformations to occur in steel and because of this possibility we see a very large variation of uh, very large variation of uh, uh, crystallographic forms and hence large variation of properties. We also see that steel will have uh, certain transformations which are called invariant transformations and uh, this invariant transformations are dictated by the Gibbs phase rule which says the degree of freedom is uh, given by a relationship which says the F the degree of freedom is equal to the number of components present plus 1 which uh, represents here only the temperature but actually it can be 2 if it is a non condensed system where both influences of temperature and pressure are important. But for all condensed systems only temperature matters, variation of temperature matters. So, C plus 1 minus the number of phases present. So, since this is a binary, so since we are talking about binary, so obviously wherever we have uh, three phases coexisting, for example, at this eutectic point or at this peritectic point or at this eutectoid point, uh, we have a situation which is called invariant and as a result we see a transformation where for example, here liquid then gamma and Fe3C should be simultaneously present. So, um, these invariant transformations this is not of much use because this is at a high temperature involving a liquid. This certainly has a wide range of applications because it allows the fusion temperature to be drastically decreased from over 1500. Uh, or larger to very low temperature. So, it makes casting very easy. So, this varieties of uh, iron car carbon or iron cementite system is called cast iron and uh, the name cast iron essentially is derived is uh, mainly to uh, signify that casting is very much uh, conducive at this uh, low melting alloys. But um, the difference between cast iron and steel is not necessarily only in terms of composition, but essentially in terms of this particular horizontal called eutectic isotherm. So, any composition which intersects this eutectic isotherm is called cast iron and the remaining are essentially called steel. But in plain carbon steel or plain carbon system without much of alloying elements, typically this boundary is at about 2 percent of carbon. Now, coming to the main issue as to why steel is so important as we said that the specific heat is going to be uh, the factor which determines whether um, uh, we have what form of crystallographic what crystallography form of iron is present and this kind of transformations called the allotropic transformation which are reversible transformations of pure elements from one particular crystal form to another. So, because of the uh, presence of these kind of allotropic changes 1, 2, 3 and 4 until room temperature for pure iron, we see a wide variation of properties possible in this steel. We will elaborate more in, uh, as, as we go along. So, what is important is that at room temperature the phase aggregate that we see can be widely varied as we cool from liquid state to lower temperature. So, when the phase aggregates change the microstructure changes and when the microstructure changes the properties change. 
the, for the steel part, the most important transformation is this eutectoid change. And this eutectoid change essentially means when gamma transforms, should simultaneously transforms to uh, ferrite and cementite. Now, this is a solid solution and this is an interstitial compound. The combination of this very hard phase with relatively softer matrix gives you a, a product solid at the end which can actually be uh, varied in terms of its mechanical properties over a wide range. And this is exactly the reason why steel is so versatile. So here is an alloy which in solid state can give you mechanical strength anywhere from few hundred to over thousand megapascal. Here is an alloy which can give you ductility as low as a few percent to close to 100 percent depending on the uh, typical microstructural, microstructural state we are talking about. In particular, steel also is one of the very rare alloys which uh, apart from showing large variations of mechanical strength can also provide us a very uh, high amount of uh, toughness. So, combination of strength and toughness is what makes steel so versatile for various kinds of structural applications. So, we um, now we need to move on and uh, understand as to what are the possible variations of uh, steel uh, microstructure that makes it so versatile. So, um, if you look at, we first saw the phase diagram and as I mentioned, it is essentially an equilibrium diagram which only talks about the existence of phases and phase aggregates depending upon the temperature com uh, and, and composition variation or combination. Uh, but then when you are talking about a transformation, you bring in the kinetic factor which means you now need to invoke the idea of how does the microstructure change with time. So, whenever you bring in the, uh, the, the, um, the need to, disc to bring in time component, so um, you have to uh, now talk about the so called kinetic diagrams. And here is a kinetic diagram which is nothing but a temperature time. So, variation of essentially variation when you are varying temperature and time independently, how does the microstructure change? And uh, this is uh, basically explained in terms of certain boundary of transformations. Uh, for example, this is one curve which actually shows the beginning of a particular type of transformation. This is the other end which is the end of such a transformation. And the transformation that we are talking about is essentially the eutectoid transformation which we just heard as uh, a transformation which involves uh, transformation of austenite which is an FCC solid solution of interstitial carbon in uh, gamma iron uh, into B BCC uh, ferrite and uh, cementite. So, this is eutectoid transformation, but this eutectoid transformation depending upon where it is actually intersecting the beginning and the end. For example, if the, uh, if the intersection of the time temperature plot is somewhat like this then you end up getting a, a microstructure which is perlitic where we have alternate sequence of cementite and this bright regions are ferrite. So, we have cementite and fer two cementite and in between the bright regions are ferrite. So, this lamellar alternated structure gives us one set of properties which actually is a very nice combination of strength and ductility. And this is called pearlite because this morphology resembles the mother of pearl. Just as you see the shell, uh, this morphology is uh, contour wise very similar to that. So, that is where the name is derived from. But instead of cooling at this rate, if you happen to cool for example, in a stepped manner like this, then you are likely to see another transformation product, uh, essentially the same eutectoid transformation, same invariant transformation. But uh, the, the phase aggregate, the mechanism and the sequence of uh, evolution of the phases and uh, their uh, volume fraction distribution is different because the mechanism of transformation is different and that aggregate is called bainite. The uh, interesting fact here is that we are talking about two aggregates 
perlite and bainite which are nothing but the phase aggregates. The difference lies primarily in terms of the uh, appearance or the microstructure, but also in the mechanism. In case of perlite, usually cementite nucleates first. So, essentially if you are talking about uh, two grains, so if this is the prior austenitic microstructure, all grains are gamma or austenite. So, on this boundary, you would first happen to see certain nucleation of cementite and this kind of a boundary will tend to move uh, when, when you form such cementite lamellae and when they actually grow edge wise simultaneously the portion in between transforms to uh, ferrite. So, nucleation of ferrite, nucleation of cementite triggering formation of ferrite because of carbon depletion. So, this is how we end up getting such lamellar aggregate where the volume fraction of this aggregate is purely dictated by the phase diagram. On the other hand, when we talk of bainite which essentially forms at a much lower temperature and because of lower temperature now we are talking about a much larger undercooling and hence much uh, greater uh, driving force. So, under this larger driving force when the transformation begins and ends at a lower temperature we end up getting a microstructure where for a difference the ferritic sheaves nucleate first. So, essentially you will see such sheaf like structure of just like leaf. So, these are like uh, palm leaf type of a structure and uh, this in when, when such a ferritic sheaf nucleates the excess carbon is rejected and those excess carbons uh, nucleate as small stringers or platelets uh, in the form of platelets either between two such consecutive sheaves or embedded within the sheaves. So, accordingly we get sort of upper and lower bainite. So, what is important for us to know is that if the microstructure changes from such pure lamellar alternate sequence of ferrite cementite to a situation where we have broad leaf or sheaf kind of a structure of ferrite within which uh, uh, cementite is embedded, we end up getting uh, fairly different kind of uh, uh, properties. In fact, we will come to that in a, in a minute. So, from equilibrium diagram what we uh, earlier uh, saw, so from this equilibrium diagram wherein we saw, uh, so while talking about this uh, steel part of the diagram what we have seen is that this is the portion which is very very important for us because from a single phase we are going into a two phase aggregate and the way the two phases manifest themselves or present themselves in the microstructure uh, makes it possible to call it perlite or bainite and because of these two aggregates different types of aggregates which arise or emerge because of two different um, uh, uh, two different uh, mechanisms of transformations we actually see two different types of microstructures. We will talk about bainite later. Now, uh, the next uh, question is to be uh, now to make things even more clearer we actually need to um, follow this microstructural evolution a little bit more. But before we do that I must tell you that this kind of a kinetic diagram that we are seeing here. So, this kinetic diagram of uh, essentially time temperature plot uh, is typical of uh, plain carbon steel and the difference here uh, what is important noting at this point is that this region is the so called knee region. This is where just like our uh, the knee of our leg is a joint between the upper and the lower part of the limb and if this is the portion where it bends and this is where it comes closest to the temperature axis or in other words this is the limit defined time limit defined which is uh, uh, which is important if we want to avoid intersecting any of these curves. So, if I need to intersect the start line or the curve which is designating the starting of the perlitic or bainitic transformations then I need to employ a cooling rate which is very very fast. So, our ability to avoid intersecting any of these lines will be determined by the gap between the temperature axis and the tip of this knee and this is called critical cooling rate. For, a, for various transformations particularly for martensitic transformations 
we would like to have a situation where this knee portion is actually shifted to the right. And if we can shift it way to the right, then I can afford to cool fairly slow instead of so fast and yet be able to avoid the start of these perlytic or benedic transformations and then intersect the martensitic line which is way below easily. And if I cool slow, the advantage is that I incur less or least amount of thermal shock because I am cooling all the way from above 800 to room temperature. So, this 800 degree of uh, uh, gradient is large if we need to cool within a few seconds or less than a second. So, the cooling rate we are talking about is actually few hundred centigrades per second. So, in order to make life easier to be able to not only uh, avoid the intersection with this perlytic or benetic parts, also if we want similar slow cooling somewhat like this where I can take life easy and cool slowly like this and get perlite. If I cool slightly faster, then I, I actually can uh, uh, get into bainite and make full bainitic microstructure. And if otherwise, if I cool even not as slow as this, but fairly slow and still if I am able to make, uh, uh, if I am able to avoid both uh, 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 initiation of perlytic or benetic transformation and still end up getting complete martensite, that is also possible. So, simply by varying the cooling rates from 1 to 2 to 3, I am able to vary the microstructure over a wide range. And this is exactly the reason why steel is the most versatile structural material for all kinds of structural applications. So, to be able to understand as to why this is happening, we must be able to appreciate both the varieties or the information available in the phase diagram and also the application of such kinetic diagrams. But there is one important part which I have not talked about and that is how do we change the shape and the contour of such a kinetic diagram from this uh, fairly uh, start and finish. So, exactly from this kind of a manifestation to somewhat uh, a different kind of a shape which is very convenient to me. So, I have split this curve and this curve into 1, 2 and a line. So, instead of having a diagram like this, which essentially by the way is called the TTT diagram, time temperature transformation diagram, but here the cooling is isothermal. But instead of time temperature transformation, if we want to refer to continuous cooling, then we have slight variation of these diagrams uh, uh, through some uh, kinetic analysis, we can actually transform this TTT into continuous cooling transformation diagram. And then we can apply this kind of uh, continuous cooling curves and then predict what kind of a microstructure we are going to get. So, the point I am trying to make is that if I want uh, uh, this uh, change in shape of this kind of a TTT or CCT into such split portions. So, instead of having such uh, a kind of a curve, curve situation, if we want to split and split such a way either like this. So, this portion is perlite and this portion is bainite. So, in order to split the two curves like this or completely have two different curves for perlite and bainite, we need to bring in another uh, influence and that influence is coming from the so called alloying elements. So, if I alloy the steel with various, various kinds of alloying elements uh, and in fact, the alloying elements can be of three types. One is one set of uh, elements which stabilize ferrite, we call them ferrite stabilizers, another form which stabilizes gamma or austenite, we call them austenite stabilizers and another form which actually stabilizes or has a large tendency for formation of carbides. This is uh, proving little difficult for me to write on this board. 
Anyway, so the point I am trying to make is that all elements usually which are BCC in terms of their Bravo lattices, they are usually the ferrite stabilizers. Alloying elements which carry FCC crystal structure or Bravo lattice are usually the uh, uh, austenite stabilizers and there are elements both coming from BCC and FCC varieties, but usually the BCC ones which have a large tendency for the formation of various kinds of carbides like for example, titanium or tungsten and so on. Though uh, they, this is HCP and this is BCC, but they have a, a very high affinity for carbon and when, when they combine with carbon, they form these carbides. So, playing with the composition by adding ferrite stabilizer or, or austenite stabilizers, we can shift the contour of not only the kinetic diagram, but actually the phase diagram. And from the phase diagram, we can also derive the various differences that are possible for uh, such kinetic diagrams. So, splitting of these curves and giving them giving space in between so that I can cool slowly and then much easily derive the microstructures which are perlitic or benetic or martensitic in nature. Uh, that is quite possible by using such uh, uh, influence of alloying elements. But uh, even for the same steel, if I am not willing to change the composition, if I am not actually uh, going to have uh, variations uh, of uh, or ad addition of various alloying elements. For the same steel which I alluded right in the beginning, I can cool relatively slow, slightly faster, still faster and much faster and the fastest. So, by way of employing di different kinds of cooling rates, I actually can get coarse perlitic microstructure, fine perlitic microstructure, combination of martensite and perlite and then finally, full martensitic microstructure. So, such wide variation of microstructure is possible on the same steel in the, in the similar setup, but simply by employing different kinds of cooling rates. And this kind of variation of cooling rates essentially are kinetic intervention onto the same alloy giving rise to such differences in micro, micro aggregates or phase aggregate and as a result, the composition can very uh, significantly vary. So, um, one thing which I did not quite mention is the fact that when we talk of all these transformations, these are all transformations happening on cooling. But if you look at this phase diagram, we must begin from a similar level playing ground and that is austenite. So, in order to create this uh, go into this austenite phase first for any transformation before we actually think of any such transformation, we must uh, read this or understand this uh, kinetic diagram again very carefully. And this is a kinetic diagram with a difference because here what we are saying is that if you start from this point which is uh, essentially the, the room uh, temperature point and this is the starting point. So, in terms of temperature and uh, time, we are, this is the uh, starting point. So, if you cool, if you sorry, heat in these two possible modes, then you realize that uh, in order to reach homogeneous austenite state, you require much larger time. On the other hand, if you are actually willing to heat to higher temperature, so if the temperature is low, then we need to heat for longer period of time or hold for longer period of time. If we are willing to heat to higher temperature, then at a much, so if we are willing to heat to higher temperature, we are uh, expect, we may expect to reach a homogeneous austenite state at a much lower time frame. So, it is important for us before we begin any such transformation to make sure that the austenite is single phase. So, the microstructure will be such single phase microstructure, all, all austenite and all exactly of the same composition. So, homogeneous both in terms of microstructure and composition. Then only the on cooling whatever microstructure you develop will be reproducible precise and give you the same kind of same set of properties that you want. So, um, 
this is something which we have discussed earlier, but I thought I would just touch upon it once more to tell you that when we talk of uh, various um, uh, forms or particularly two major forms of iron, pure iron namely the uh, BCC at room temperature and FCC at high temperature. So, in these two varieties the unit cell which is the smallest building block for any uh, bravelatis or crystal structure for that matter allows us to calculate the typical size of the void. So, in case of FCC uh, this is how we can calculate the size of the void and uh, this uh, if this is the diameter of the iron atom in the BCC form this is how one can calculate the, the tetrahedral or the octahedral void size for uh, BCC iron. Similarly, for FCC we can calculate the tetrahedral and the octahedral I am sorry this should be the octahedral uh, void size for, uh, uh, for uh, carbon or any other interstitial atom to come and squeeze in. This is important for us to know because this size relative sizes of these interstitial voids essentially determines what will be the solubility of such interstitial atoms. When, we are, when I was uh, referring to uh, alloying elements I should have mentioned that uh, principally the alloying elements uh, will, will actually they will be of two types one is the so called interstitial and the other one is substitutional. The interstitial ones are the ones which can squeeze into these holes, but these sizes of these holes are actually always smaller than the uh, even the smallest possible atom one can think of. So, whenever we push in such interstitial atom there will be lot of strain field around that and because of which solubility is limited. So, the solubility part is primarily in particular in case with regard to steel is determined by the so called interstitial void sizes and it is because of this reason you can pack in always more amount of carbon in FCC variety than in BCC. But on the other hand the, the voids in the BCC are interconnected and it is because of this reason that uh, the carbon diffuses faster in the BCC variety than in FCC variety. So, solubility is higher in FCC, but diffusivity is higher in BCC and both these properties are very important in terms of determining whether uh, for, for various kinds of phase transformations and uh, phase aggregates that we want to bring in. So, um, so, this is what I was trying to say that if you bring in uh, different kinds of phase aggregates for example, when you have perlytic aggregate or bainitic aggregate this is the strength properties and this is the hardness properties in terms of the Rockwell scale. So, the temperature scale here is somewhat similar to the temperature scale that you see in the TTT diagram and what it shows is that if you start from this end that means, if you uh, actually uh, uh, allow the transformation to take place at relatively high temperature. So, somewhere let us say in this region or in this region. So, this is how the temperature is decreasing and as the temperature decreases what we see is that the strength properties both in terms of hardness or yield strength or any other uh, strength uh, representations will always show you higher and higher value. So, given a choice if you are looking for very high hardness or very high strength for that matter then obviously, uh, you would prefer to have a bainitic microstructure than perlytic microstructure. But the problem is that in case of plain carbon steel because of the nature or the curvature of this uh, TTT or the CCT diagram and the cooling rate obviously is, is going to have slightly just the opposite kind of a curvature. So, two curves of opposite curvatures can intersect only once and not twice. I mean uh, it can be tangential at the most, but you cannot uh, using another kind of a cooling curve with a different curvature there is no way this curve can actually intersect the cur other curve with a different opposite curvature at a portion below the knee below the, uh, the tip of the curvature. So, you need a step quenching in other words if you want bainite then you cannot employ a continuous cooling like you can do for perlite 
you have to do a stepped cooling and this stepped cooling kind of a transformation is called Ostempering and so it's called os tempering and, and this os tempering is a, a, a heat treatment which requires such uh, stepped cooling. So in order to get higher strength properties like here, we actually need to allow the transformation to take place at lower temperatures and such transformation is possible not by continuous cooling but by stepped cooling. So, uh, so with uh, this now we uh, actually would like to uh, summarize and as a way of recapitulation what we have understood in this uh, discourse is what is iron cementite diagram and uh, I did not quite mention but it is for you to make out the difference between the so called uh, precise equilibrium diagram which is called iron carbon or in some cases called iron graphite diagram because graphite is the stablest form of carbon in uh, steel. Uh, so the differences will be in terms of the composition of the invariant transformations and their, uh, uh, the isothermal temperatures where actually these transformations uh, uh, are happening. So we talked about various invariant transformations, in fact all the allotropic changes, the two melting of the two uh, components and then the three um, uh, invariant transformations peritectic, eutectic and eutectoid all these are invariant transformations and they are very important because they determine the microstructural evolution of the alloys not of the pure iron or pure cementite. Um, we understood that the ability to vary the uh, properties namely the mechanical properties of steel which is what makes it so versatile is possible purely because of the ability to vary the microstructure over a very wide range and this is not quite possible in uh, almost all types of other metallic or non-metallic systems or alloys. Uh, we understood the difference between uh, the evolution of perlite and bainite primarily in terms of the temperature range where it happens, the, the morphologies of the phases and most importantly the mechanism as to what nucleates and what promotes the formation of the, um, the counterpart. So it is uh, in case of perlite, uh, cementite uh, leading to formation of uh, fer uh, ferrite. In case of uh, uh, bainite it is actually because of large undercooling it is first ferrite and followed by uh, nucleation of uh, cementite. Of course there is some amount of controversy uh, uh, existing about exact mechanism whether it is a diffusional or there is a non-diffusional component but that is a different subject altogether. Um, we uh, also saw how the interstitial void sizes are different in FCC and BCC form of iron and which is why uh, the solubilities are different in these two forms of uh, iron and uh, uh, alloys. Um, the most important thing is that we need to understand the difference between the phase diagrams or the equilibrium diagrams and kinetic diagrams. For example, when we talk of solubility you certainly refer to thermodynamic diagram. When you talk of uh, evolution of phase aggregate or the rate at which they, they uh, appear you have to refer to a kinetic diagram. So the last thing that I need to mention is that uh, we talked entirely about the bulk of the steel. All these discussion are related to the bulk of the steel. And uh, when we go to the next lecture, we will realize as to why it is important for us to uh, appreciate what happens in the bulk of the steel even though this particular entire discussion is related to a course called surface engineering. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>